Ephesians 5, verses 1 through 11, and the King James text today reads, I'll put it up on the screen for you, so you can read it if you don't have a Bible in the house. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment, King Jesus. Master, today we are so thrilled and happy to be in the house of God. Today it's a blessing that we have lived these many years in a country that allows us to assemble, to worship, to believe, to study the Word of God as we feel in our own heart, in our own conviction. Master, today it is a thrill to be able to come into the house of God because every time we come, we don't know what to expect. Will God heal today? Will the Lord deliver? Will the Lord fill with the Holy Ghost? Will God save some soul today who's lost? Will He reclaim some backslider? Oh, Master, today I've loved the house of God since I was a child. I love the move of God. I love to see a living God at work. And more than all this, I love the Word of God. I love your Spirit. And Lord, when the Spirit of God quickens the Word of God in the mouth of the preacher, there is nothing sweeter to the hearing. And Father, today in the name of Jesus, I ask that you would anoint this messenger. Allow me to deliver your Word humbly powerfully in love so that the people of God might not only hear it, but they might receive it and that it might be good seed upon good ground bringing forth fruit unto righteousness, godliness, and true holiness. Anoint every ear, touch every ear. Those in this room, those watching now live, those, Lord, who will later watch by reason of the internet, Allow every hearer to be anointed of the Holy Ghost so their heart might be cultivated by your love to receive that which I'm about to speak. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise amen. God and amen. amen. You know, there has been more pain and more hurt visited upon lost souls upon families, even upon believers who have been pushed away from the church all in the name of quote-unquote godly separation. 
families have been divided in the name of godly separation. I know my family has. I've got, I've got family, you know, while I was in Connecticut visiting my great aunt, bless her heart, you know, I told her, I said, well, I've got a aunt named Faith. I said, Faith is too holy to even be in the same room with me. Now, my, now Faith belongs to a church that's way more liberal than my Aunt Betty's church. My Aunt Betty's church is way more conservative and strict, you know, with all the standards and the codes and all that. And I said, but Faith, when Grandma Bill was living, she wouldn't even stay, Bill, in the same room with me. If I was visiting my grandmother, my Aunt Faith, who lived in the same house, she would get up and go off to another room because she was just too holy to be in the company of someone like me. I could talk to my grandmother about the Bible. I could talk to my grandmother about Jesus. I could talk to her about the church. She didn't agree with everything I said or everything I believed, but you know what? We could have a respectful, decent conversation. I will give my grandmother credit for that. She didn't give... It took a while. In the beginning, she was rough. <laughs> but when I came into affirming ministry, things kind of changed in her. My grandparents respected me and they respected what I did. They knew how I lived my life and they respected me, you know. Well, faith is just so holy. And I told my Aunt Betty this. And my Aunt Betty kind of laughed. She said, oh my goodness. She said, how terrible is that? How horrible is that? She said, my goodness, Jesus ate with prostitutes. Jesus ate with sinners. It doesn't matter if you agree or disagree with somebody. She said, that's not Christ-like. That's not Christian love. Here's my Aunt Betty who belongs to a way more conservative church than faith does. But she gets it. But do you know how many people have been hurt because they've got family members? Oh, bless God, who are so holy that why well, they're not going to have nothing to do with their queer child. They're not going to have anything to do with their gay brother. They're not going to have anything to do with their lesbian aunt. Hello now. How many families have been divided over issues even beyond the LGBT? Oh no, that person smokes. Or that person doesn't belong to our denomination. Or that person doesn't belong to our organization. And therefore, the Word of God tells me in verse 11, Ephesians 5, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness but rather reprove them. I'm to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. You know, there is nothing in the world that does more damage to God's people than preachers who preach Scripture, and yet they do not preach it true, and they do not preach it right. Mm -hmm. right. See, today I've titled my message, The Truth about godly separation because godly separation is a truth that is something that we do need to embrace that is something we do need to understand but we need to understand it in truth right we don't need to understand it according to the way the JWs teach it. We don't need to understand it according to the way the UPC teaches it. We don't need to understand it according to the way the Southern Baptists teach it. We don't need to understand it according to the way that the Church of God teaches it. No, we need to understand it according to the actual words of the Apostle Paul to the church at Ephesus. There are four key words... In the passage, Ephesians 5 and verse 11, which is what I'm concentrating on today, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. There are four key words. The first key word is fellowship. Paul said, have no fellowship. Well, according to many churches and many denominations and religious organizations, that means that we're not to, to keep company with these people. That means we're not to have meals with these people. That means we're to separate ourselves from these people in the name of godly separation. But what does the word actually mean? Well, the Greek word that I cannot even begin to pronounce, S-U-G-K-O-I-N-O-N-E-O. -O -O. If you think you can pronounce it, then have a party. That word literally is translated to become a partaker together 
with others or to have fellowship with a thing. Say, well, what does that mean? That means in order to have fellowship, you've got to be partaking in the same thing the others are partaking of. In other words, you've heard the term fellowship of firefighters, right? Well, now, there's not an actual gathering of firefighters where every firefighter in the country comes together. There's not necessarily even an organization for firefighters around the world. And yet, if you're a firefighter, you're considered to be part of the fellowship of firefighters. Why? Because y'all do the same kind of work. The same thing is said, for instance, of people in law enforcement. There's a fellowship of blue. You know, there's a fellowship of law enforcement. Anybody who works in law enforcement is considered to be part of the same fellowship. Why? Because they all do the same kind of work. So the term fellowship, have no fellowship, literally means don't do these things. It does not talk about people. There is no reference here to people. It is a reference to what you're doing, not who you're doing it with. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. To become a partaker together with others or to have fellowship with a thing. Now listen, the second, uh, the, the second key word in this passage is unfruitful. A-K-A-R-P-O-S is the Greek word. Akarpos. Metaphorically, it means without fruit, barren, not yielding what it ought to yield. Paul said, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. So he is saying that we are not to participate in activities that do not allow us or cause us to bear fruit. Aha, uh -huh. that's a little different, isn't it, than just avoiding everybody, don't believe like we believe. That's a little different than just, uh, you know, walking away from people who live a life that we don't agree with. That's not at all, that's not even remotely what Paul was saying. If you look at the beginning of uh, Ephesians 5, look at how Paul started this chapter. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love. How in the world do you think Paul's going to start out talking about walking in love as Christ also hath loved us? When did Christ love us? After we cleaned up our act? No. The Word of God said, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Hallelujah. While we were yet sinners, Christ loved us. Am I telling the truth today? You see, you got to be able to love the unbeliever every bit as quick and easy as you can love the believer. you got to be able to love people outside of your organization and outside of your denomination every, quick, every bit quick and easy as you can love somebody inside your denomination or inside your organization. you got to be able to love people that believe the way you believe and those that don't believe the way you believe. you got to be able to love people that live the way you live and people that don't live the way you live. And there is no scriptural mandate to abstain from interacting with these people, but rather there is a biblical mandate in Ephesians 5.11 to not participate in those activities that they engage in that are contrary to to bearing fruit. Hello now. It's pretty simple, isn't it, Johnny? Yeah. I can tell you a story about when I was a young person. I was dating that girl I mentioned earlier, Barbara. I was always 15, going on 16, you know. And she had a brother that used to hang out in the woods with a bunch of kids, and they were up to no good, I'll tell you. <laughs> Smoking pot and doing all kinds of things, you know. Well, there was a kid in the neighborhood who was known to be kind of on the wild side. He was a little bit older boy. I think he was about 19. He drove a Cadillac Coupe de Ville. 
There was a reason he drove that pretty car, because he made money doing things he ought not have been doing, if you get my drift. Well, I'd go spend time with Barbara at her house, and sometimes we'd go out with this fella, whose name happened to be Chucky. Can you believe it? My name's sick. And he and I, and Barbara, and some of her friends, and what have you, we'd all go out together in his car. And one day, her brother thought he was going to be cute. Now, mind you, this was a two-door car. It wasn't a four-door. Of course, back those days, Cadillac was a boat, you know. So even in the back seat with a two-door, you had lots of room, you know. And her brother decided Billy thought he's going to be cute, and he lit up a joint. Now, I've never smoked pot in my life. To this day, God is my eternal witness. I've never touched the stuff. I've never touched any drug any illicit substance. And he lit up a joint and he said, we're going to get Charles high on a contact high. So he started, you know, puffing on it and blowing the smoke out. He's going to get me high because he knew I wouldn't do this stuff, you know. I said, Billy, stop. Chucky, stop the car and let me out. See, I don't mind spending time with y'all, but I'm not going to participate in the same activities you participate. Do you follow what I'm telling you? That is having fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. It doesn't have anything to do with the people. It has to do with what they're doing. I can enjoy the people. I can like the people. I can love the people. I can have plenty of discourse with the people. But when they start doing things that I'm not going to do because I know better, I'm going to part company. Do you hear what I'm telling you? I said, stop the car, I'm getting out. And Chucky kind of got in on it. He said, oh no, I'm going to keep going. He thought he was funny. So I leaned back against Barbara and her friend Brenda. Tommy knows Brenda as well. I leaned up against their laps and I put my foot up against the window. You know that back opera window behind on the old Cadillac Cucumber. See, you kids are too young to remember, but back in those days, you actually could roll the windows down in the back, you know, and all that. I put my, my foot up against that window. I said, all right, I'm going to give you 10 seconds, and I'm going to kick this window out. But one way or the other, I'm not going to let that smoke get up in my lungs. All of a sudden, Chucky's rolling down the windows of the car, telling Billy to put that joint out. Put that thing out. Let's stop messing with him. Let's stop playing with him. He didn't want his car broke up. Doesn't have anything to do with the people. People do ungodly things. People do wicked things. People do evil things. But that doesn't always make the person wicked. That doesn't always make the person evil. That doesn't always make the person ungodly. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? See, a lot of people don't understand. Paul was a Pharisee. He was a rabbi in the Jewish faith. Paul understood. He had a way of looking at things that you and I don't look at things. And when he wrote, he wrote with a specific understanding of certain issues. You see, the law of Moses never labeled people bad. Did you hear what I said? We've got idiots in our world today run around saying, Oh, homosexuals ought to be killed because the law of Moses said homosexuals ought to be killed. Uh, no, you ignoramus, you are so far from right, it's not even funny. The law of Moses doesn't say one single word about homosexuals. Nowhere in the law of Moses do you ever read any sin being classified in a group of people. In other words, the law of Moses didn't talk about murderers. It talked about those who commit murder. The law of Moses didn't talk about homosexuals. It talked about those who committed one specific sexual act. One specific act. I got news for you. Homosexuals, as a rule, may engage in any number of various intimate acts. Not all of them do that particular act. So guess what? 
not every homosexual would fall under that category. Not every homosexual would fall under that classification. And by the way, the law of Moses didn't say one single word about females when it comes to homosexuality. Not one word. There was one specific male-on-male -male act that is spoken of in the law of Moses. Just one act. That's it. And Paul knew that sin and sinfulness and ungodliness is not applied to groups of people. It is applied to acts. God did not condemn any groups of people. If you're gay or lesbian today, God did not condemn you. If you're an alcoholic today, God did not condemn you. If God, if you're a drug addict today, God did not condemn you. If you're addicted to gambling today, God did not condemn you. He may have condemned the act, but He did not condemn you as a person. Amen. Right. And in order for any biblically ascribed punishment to be meted out, Johnny, for any act that the law said there was a punishment attached to it, in order for that punishment to be attached to that law, especially punishment involving death, stoning, burning, that sort of thing, the law also gave us very clear instructions on how one would be convicted of any given offense. And you had to be convicted in that specific way. And if you were not convicted in that specific way, then you could not have the punishment carried out against you. In Deuteronomy 19, excuse me, in Deuteronomy 17 and verse 5, the word of God said, at the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death. But at the mouth of one witness he shall not be put to death. See, Johnny, if somebody committed murder and one person saw him commit the act, that wasn't enough to convict him. You had to have at least two people witness the act. They had to witness the offense. If it was rape, they had to have more than one person who physically witnessed the rape. If it was uh, uh, murder, they had to have more than one person. If it was robbery, if it was anything that involved punishment, then there had to be one, excuse me, at least two or three witnesses. In Deuteronomy 19.15, the Word of God said, One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin. In any sin that he sinneth at the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the Word be established. So there was very specific rules as to how the law could be carried out. So if somebody was accused of being involved in a specific sex act, they had to have some two or three people at least who physically saw the act carried out. When I researched this issue, I looked into the Jewish background, the, the, the Jewish faith, and I did some research into... How often was corporal punishment, death, you know, visited upon people for breaking the Mosaic Law? And I was reading all these articles and all these publications written by Jewish rabbis and Jewish teachers. Do you know what I found out? Very seldom. How often did they stone people? Very seldom. Very seldom. They said actually it was far less common than you would ever imagine. God's not stupid. God knows that if I could get you killed by accusing you of doing something bad, that all I'd have to do is bear false witness against you, and boom, you're, you're dead. Mm -hmm. So he said, no, if there are two or three witnesses, then you cannot uh, uh, call that person a murderer. 
So in other words, you could not label that man a murderer unless there were two or three witnesses. You could not label that man a, uh, a, a thief unless there were two or three witnesses. Do you follow what I'm telling you? Do you see why God didn't classify people according to sin? No. He condemned the sin. He condemned the action, not the person. Do you follow what I'm telling you? I want you to follow this. This is important today. In 2 Corinthians 6, 17, the Apostle Paul wrote and said, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Oh, excuse me, that's the wrong passage. It's for later in the message. Hebrews 10 and verse 28 he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Okay? So I've given you three passages to help you understand that the law could only condemn someone to a punishment if there were at least two or three witnesses. Alright? That's important and I'll tell you why. We've got people today who say, the law of Moses, God's law says homosexuals ought to be killed. Oh, really? Let me tell you what else God's law says. Unless you have two or three witnesses to the act. Well, there were men doing something in a public park. And there were three witnesses. I got news for you. They're in trouble. Because... That qualifies. Do you follow what I'm telling you? But as long as you keep your private business private, there's not a thing in the world anybody can do about it. And that's what God said. That's not what Charles said. That's not what the preacher said. That's what the Word of God said. If you're going to do stuff you ought not to be doing, don't be doing it out in public. Don't be doing it out where you can get caught. Don't be doing it out where you can be seen. Hello now. See, we got people now, they seem to think, that it's fun and it's exciting to go out and do things where, you know, it's public. And no, it's not. It's ignorant and it's foolish. Hello now, if I may say so. The mandate of Paul found in Ephesians 5.11 is not what we are to have. Excuse me, not that we are to have nothing to do with unbelievers or those who engage in conduct and behaviors that we know to be sinful or offensive, but rather that we abstain from engaging with them in the activity. We're to abstain from engaging with them in the behavior. We're to, we're to abstain from engaging with them in the sin. God does not break His own rules. Jesus Christ ate with sinners and befriended prostitutes, dishonest men, publicans, which means they were public officials, politicians, tax collectors, men who were infamous for taking bribes and for fleecing people. And he ate with those whom the law would view as unclean. He did not engage in the activities that they engaged in, but he certainly engaged with them as human beings. Am I telling the truth? We ought to be able to live a godly standard regardless of the behavior of those around us. Am I telling the truth today? Yes, yes. Amen. Now listen, there are four key words in Ephesians 5.11. So far we've talked about fellowship. We've talked about unfruitful. Let's look now at the word that is translated works. Ergon. E-R-G-O-N. Works. Business. Employment. That which anyone is occupied. That with which anyone is occupied. That which one undertakes to do. An enterprise or an undertaking. Any product, whatever. Anything accomplished by hand, art, industry, or mind. An act, deed, thing done. The idea of working is emphasized in opposition to that which is less than work. 
So therefore have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Again, this isn't even beginning to talk about people. It's talking about works, their actions, that which they set their hand to do. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Oh, but I'm a Christian and I won't bake a cake for a gay couple. You're an idiot. You are an idiot. If you think you're making a stand in the name of godly separation, you are an idiot. I-D-I-O-T, if I may say so. Did they ask you to go to bed with them? Did they ask you to engage in some sex act that you believe to be sinful? No, they did not. They asked me to bake a cake. Well then, stupid, bake the cake. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Has nothing to do with the people. It has to do with the conduct. Hello now. Has to do with the action. It has to do with the sin or the offense. If you're not being asked to engage in a sinful act or an offense to God, then folks, i got news for you. You are not experiencing tribulation. You are not being uh, tormented. You are not by any means suffering persecution. We've got it all twisted. We've got people being hurt in the church world today all because Christians have no idea what godly separation really means. Am I telling the truth today? Mm -hmm. Amen. In Galatians 5 verses 19 through 23, listen, terms are used here that we're looking at in Ephesians 5.11. Now the works of the flesh are these adultery fornication uncleanness lasciviousness idolatry witchcraft hatred variance emulations wrath strife seditions heresies envyings murders drunkenness revelings revelings and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. Ephesians 5.11, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. If you want to know what Paul's talking about in Ephesians 5.11, look over at Galatians 5 and 19.20. And 21. Am I telling the truth? Line upon line, precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. So that tells us that what Paul is talking about in Ephesians 5.11 has nothing in the universe to do with people. It has to do with actions, behaviors, sins, Offenses. The works of the flesh are born in darkness. Nothing, Johnny, can grow, thrive, or flourish and bear fruit in darkness. You want to kill a tree? Turn the lights out. You want to kill a plant? Make sure it can't get any light. I've got garden beds that I put in around the house. And there's one simple way to prevent the grass from growing up in the garden bed. There's one simple way to prevent it from growing up underneath your plants and your flowers and all. And what do you do, Bill? You put down a dark cloth on the ground, right? Then you put your wood chips on top of that. And what happens? You, do you stop water from getting in? No. What do you stop? Sunlight. And by cutting off the sunlight, 
that grass cannot grow. Those weeds cannot grow. Am I telling the truth? You see, the works of darkness are born are born in darkness. Amen. They're committed, the Word of God said, in darkness. Evil deeds are done in the dark, the Word of God says. So we do not want to participate in actions and behaviors which are incapable of helping us to bear fruit. The works of the flesh, the works of the flesh are fruitless. Hmm. Our godly conduct, our godly conversation, and our godly behaviors bring to light the fruitlessness of ungodly conduct. We're not to run around preaching at rebuking and chastising people, but rather we ought to demonstrate through our godly living a better path that humanity can walk. Hallelujah. Amen. Why do I say that? Well, because in verse 11, Ephesians 5, the Apostle Paul said, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. We've already covered fellowship, unfruitful, and, dark, and works. But then he finishes by saying, But rather reprove them. Well, that means we're supposed to stand there with picket signs at gay pride parades, doesn't it? That means we're supposed to pick at abortion clinics, doesn't it? No, it's not what it means. Reprove comes from a word. Eleko, E-L-E-G-C-H-O in the Greek, to convict, refute, or confute, generally with a suggestion of shame of the person convicted, by conviction to bring to the light or to expose. I don't see anywhere in there it says I'm supposed to preach or I'm supposed to rebuke. Or I'm supposed to chastise anybody. So I'm supposed to bring to the light. I'm supposed to bring conviction. Smith Wigglesworth was one of the greatest men of God in the latter part of the, uh, the uh, uh, 18th century leading into the 19th century. He was one of the earliest Pentecostal pioneers. He had an incredible healing ministry. Under the ministry of Smith Wigglesworth, the dead were raised. I mean, to tell you, God moved in mighty ways. He was from England, and listen to this, he was part of the Salvation Army organization. He received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and he began to preach divine healing and the power of God and the baptism of the Holy Ghost and God began to heal people by the thousands. They literally used to bring people to Smith Wigglesworth's meetings on stretchers from hospitals. People who were slated to die, people the doctors had given up on, and they would literally carry them in an ambulance to the meeting, bring them down to the front of the church. Smith Wigglesworth would lay hands on them and God would heal them. Smith Wigglesworth had an incredible testimony. But you want to know what one of the strangest things about Smith Wigglesworth was? People who rode with him and traveled with him, they said he would be on a train sitting in a seat reading his Bible and all of a sudden people sitting around him would begin to weep and they would say to him, Please, sir, show me the way to God. I'm convicted of my sin just being in His presence. He didn't say a word. He didn't preach a thing. But the power of God was so powerful in His life that just being around Him made people who didn't live right and didn't act right and didn't believe right and didn't do right, it made them realize, oh, I need to fight God. I need to be saved. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? That's the way we ought to be living our lives. Brother Tatlock, I've told you about him many times, the Jesus name preacher I grew up knowing a friend of my family for many, many, many decades. Brother Tatlock was the kind of man, you got around him, you could feel the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you, whew, 
he, he could be talking about chocolate, milk, and french fries. He didn't have to be talking about God. He didn't have to be talking about the Bible. I'm not kidding. He could be talking about travel. He could be talking about anything. And when you got around Brother Tatlock, the Holy Ghost was so powerful in his life that you would just feel the, in, in a positive way. But if you weren't doing right, if you weren't living right, if you weren't acting right, whoa, you'd start feeling kind of prickly. You'd feel like, Lord, I can't be around this guy because he reminds me that I need to be saved. He reminds me that I need to live for God. He reminds me that I need to do things right. But you want to know what's funny? Brother Tatlock, never one time did I know that man to condemn, criticize, or preach at anybody. Never. Never saw him do it. The year that I came out, 1989, some of you are saying, Lord, help. I wasn't even born in 1989. Well, <laughs> I went to my grandmother's house. Brother Tatlock was there. I thought, oh, Lord, help me. I know I'm going to feel terrible. I know I'm going to feel bad because I can't get in this man's presence without feeling the Holy Ghost. I got around him, and you know what? Funny enough, I didn't feel bad. I didn't feel convicted. I didn't feel terrible about having come out. And Brother Tadlock looked at me and said, Chuck, where are you preaching now, son? Well, of course, I'd left the church and left the ministry, you know, a couple uh, that year, and, you know, and I just looked at him and I started to cry because now I was starting to feel a little prickly because the Bible said the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. That means once God's called you, He never changes His mind. So what I was feeling convicted about was not that I was who I was. What I was feeling convicted about is that I wasn't doing what I'd been called to do. Do you follow what I'm telling you? He said, where are you preaching now, son? And I looked at him and tears started coming down my eyes. I said, Brother Tallock, I said, I'm not preaching right now. That's all I said. I said, I'm not preaching right now. He looked at me. He said, did God call you to preach? I said, yes, sir, because I couldn't deny it. I knew God called me and God helped me. I would never lie on God, even when I was backslid, even when I was out of church. I wasn't going to lie on God and say, no, he didn't call me. No, he did call me, and I knew he did. I said, yes, sir, he did. And Brother Tallock said, when did he tell you to quit? Boom! Boom! <laughs> right between the eyes. Do you know what Brother Tatlock helped me to do about two, three years later? He helped me to do what I'm doing right now. The words that Brother Tatlock spoke to me, Johnny, rang in my hearing. And when God, whoo, glory, when God would try to talk to my heart about ministry, to LGBT people and helping them understand God understands you. God loves you. God accepts you. Don't run from God because of who you are. He gets you. When God was trying to tell me this and tell me that I could preach and I could minister and I could help LGBT people, it was Brother Tatlock's words kept ringing in my ear. When did he tell you to stop? When did he tell you to stop? When did he, he never told me to stop, but you know what? He was telling me how I could keep going. Even within the context of who I was. Brother Tatlock never said one word against me as an LGBT person. But his words were from heaven. Because they helped to remind me I had a calling on my life. And there was still a work that I could do. It may be different than the work I had been doing. But there was still a work that I could do. Aren't you grateful for that today? Amen. I know I am. Amen. Amen. There was a high school student. When I was in high school, there was a young black man. I, I have to be honest with you. I had a bit of a crush, but we're going to stop there. He was adorable. Cute guy. And he used to just kind of mock me and make fun of me. He loved to pick on me because my nickname in high school was Rev. R-E-V, Rev. Everybody knew I was called to preach and I was going to be a preacher. And my nickname was I used to wear a, a shirt and tie every day to school when I was in high school. Yes, I did. You know why? Because God told me to do it. I, I don't know why the Lord told me to do it, but He told me to do it. Well, it made me stand out. But that's not why I did it. I did it because the Lord told me to do it. 
But I found out later that I had the respect and the admiration of every student in that high school. The principal said this, not me. I had students still that would contact me. They'd call me on the phone. They'd, they'd catch me in the hallway because they got pregnant out of wedlock and they were scared to death and they didn't know what to do and they were afraid to talk to their parents. I had kids call me on the phone who were suicidal and they were looking for help from God. The principal of the high school, when I left the high school, he said, this kid has the respect of a staff member. People in this school, children in this school, literally look at Charles the, in, with the same level of respect they look at the teachers. And I was their peer. I'm not saying that to make myself sound terrific. I'm, I'm trying to make a point about we don't have to preach at people to have a positive impact and to bring light. I come into class and I'm always smiling, you know, and I'm trying to keep a positive attitude. And I grew up in a, in a hellacious home. I grew up with a lot of abusive stuff and a lot of negative stuff at home. I used to come to school, honey, school was heaven for me compared to home. But I didn't come in all negative and all down and all griping and all grumpy. I'd come in smiling. I'd come in with a song of my heart. Tommy can tell you, you get in a car alone with me for a while and you're going to have to put up with my singing and worshiping God. You're going to have to put up with me praying because that's how I do. I'd come into class. We had our prayer meeting I told you about a couple weeks ago, you know, and I'd come to class and I'm just feeling so good and feeling so happy in the Holy Ghost, you know. And this kid, this one kid in particular, Byron, he looked at me and said, Why are you always smiling for? What you, what, what's wrong with you that you're always smiling at this guy? And he's all snarky and, you know. In the last 10 years, I got a message from Byron on Facebook. Byron said, remember how I couldn't stand the way you acted in high school? I've gotten saved. I'm born again. I'm a preacher of the gospel. Hallelujah. Why? Because I didn't say anything to him about what he did or how he did it. I just lived the right way. And by living the right way, I shined a light on his darkness. By living the right way, I helped him to realize that what he was doing and how he was doing wasn't the way to go. Do you follow what I'm telling you? And it helped him to find the Lord later in life. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? Folks, oh, if Christians in our world today understood the truth about godly separation, if they understood what the Word of God genuinely teaches the life of Christ was meant to serve as our example. He never preached at or rebuked sinners. He sat at the well with a woman who was many times married. Now living with a man without being married to him. And in biblical times there was no marriage uh, there was no marriage contract. There was no marriage license. So the fact she was living with him without being married to him simply meant she had no cognitive commitment to that man. And Jesus knew that. In essence, he could read her mind. He could read her heart. He knew, you're living with this guy and you don't even view him as your husband. You don't even love him enough to be committed. If something else come along, you'd leave him in a flat minute. That's what the Lord was saying to her. He never rebuked her. He never chastised her. He sat at meals with many that religious leaders of his day despised. Yet his light drew men and women to the love of God. In Hebrews 7 verses 20, uh, 6 and 27, Paul writes, For such an high priest became us harmless, undefiled, listen to this next phrase, separate from sinners. He's talking about Jesus. He said, we had a high priest who became like us, who was, or who is holy, harmless, harmless, harmless. 
Bible said we're to be wise as serpents and yet as harmless as a dove, as gentle as a dove. Undefiled, separate from sinners. Paul, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, Paul, Paul, Paul. You, you must be talking about a different Jesus. Because the Jesus that, that we read about in the Bible, he was not separate from sinners. Not by UPC standards. Not by Assemblies of God, not by Church of God, not by Southern Baptist uh, Convention standards. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, First Methodist Church would definitely disagree with you on whether or not Jesus was separate from sinners. But he was separate from sinners. Why? Because although he was perfectly comfortable interacting with the people, he never engaged in the activities that they engaged in that were offensive. Do you hear what I'm telling you? That is the truth about godly separation. Was Jesus separate from sinners? Absolutely. He could mingle with the dirtiest dog in town. But did he ever get down in the mud with that dog? No. He could mingle with liars and cheats. He could mingle with thieves and prostitutes. Did he ever steal did he ever engage in sex with a prostitute? Did he ever lie? Did he ever cheat somebody? No. Because just because I'm in the company of someone who behaves ungodly, I am godly enough, hello now, that I can maintain a godly standard regardless of how those people live their lives. Lastly today in Luke 15, 1 through 2. Uh, two. The Word of God declares, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And yet Paul says he was our high priest who was separate from sinners. What's the truth about godly separation? Well, the Word of God tells us in 2 Corinthians 6, 17, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. He didn't say, touch not the unclean person. He said, touch not the unclean thing. What did we say about works? God condemned the act. He didn't condemn the person. Jesus mingled with sinners. He didn't mingle with their sin. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Oh, the truth about godly separation is, if we live right in the midst of people who don't live right, then our right living is actually going to bring conviction on them. It's actually going to help them realize I need God in my life. I want to tell you today, folks, there's no need to hurt people. There's no need to be hurtful. As Christians, we, we should be the least offensive people on the planet. Paul said at the beginning of our passage today, be ye followers, therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Then he goes on in verse uh, 3 to say, but, and he lists sins and he lists actions and behaviors that he said we are to avoid and to abstain from. But he's not talking about people. He's talking about things. Hallelujah. Yeah. When God said, come out from among them, be ye separate, saith the Lord of hosts, touch not the unclean thing. Has nothing to do with a person. Has, as long as a gay person ain't asking you to go to bed with them, you have no reason in the universe that you cannot visit with them and be perfectly respectful be perfectly kind, be perfectly loving. There is no reason in the world. 
as long as the drunkard isn't asking you to get drunk with them and forcing alcohol down your throat, there is no reason in the world that you cannot be loving to them and you cannot be kind to them and you cannot treat them respectfully. Am I telling the truth today? Whatever you perceive as their sin, whatever you perceive in their life as being offensive to God, honey, that issue doesn't have a thing in the world to do with who they are. It is what they do. And as long as they don't ask you to do it with them, then you are not entering into a fellowship with them. Am I telling the truth? Would you stand with me this afternoon?